Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those of you who aren't in the room that are tuned in. Um, it's a particularly exciting day today. We have Janet Mock here with us. And for those of you who don't know Janet, she is a New York Times bestselling author. She is a trans advocate. She is a GLAAD Award nominee. The list goes on and on and on and on. And uh, we'll learn a lot more about her as this goes on today. So uh, Janet, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Totally. <laughs> OK, so I thought it would be fun to start with some rapid fire questions. And uh, Did you introduce yourself? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> OK, I will. <laughs> I'm Michael Bolognino. I work at Google. I do marketing for Google Docs. And thank you. Yes, of course. All right. Now that that's out of the way, um, your favorite New York City season? Um, spring. OK. The fashion trend that you hope is dead? Fashion trend, Uggs. <laughs> yeah. The favorite place that you've been on vacation? Um, it has to be going home to Hawaii. OK. And the last place you went on vacation? Sarasota. Right. <laughs> Um, dogs or cats or other? Dogs. OK. Um, the golden girl you most relate to? Oh my god, Sophia. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, a living person that you haven't met that you dream to meet? Mm. Toni Morrison. OK. Um, do you have a current TV show addiction? Oh my god, I'm like trying to figure out which ones. I, I just finished True Detective. Uh -huh. I'm not obsessed with it, okay. but I think one of those like revenge, mm. which is kind of a bizarre obsession because it's like so bad, but it's so good. <laughs> totally. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Aretha Franklin or Patti LaBelle? Patti. Okay. Uh, I saw that shade. Yeah, that's what I'm referencing. <laughs> yes. I'm glad I didn't know <laughs> that she threw at her. She was like, "I'm not touching yes. your hand." So you're on the side of Patti's team. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, for breakfast, we are savory. Um, sweet. Okay, and then your favorite Janet Jackson album that is not The Velvet Rope? Um, Control. Okay, excellent. All right, now that <laughs> <laughs> now that that's out of the way, um, let's talk about. Well, things are super exciting for you right now. So before we talk about the book itself, um, you've been obviously the New York Times bestseller just happened. That's huge. Um, personally, it was just your birthday, so happy birthday. Thank you. Um, the book's doing amazing. Um, you know, what, what do you think is the highlight in the last few months for you personally? I think it's meeting people around the country and kind of sharing space and stories um, and intimacies with strangers. Because mm -hmm. I think that the bizarre thing about writing um, in a genre like memoir is that everyone knows so much about you, but you know no one, <laughs> nothing about someone else. Right. Um, and so I think that there's this, um, and it's especially with just the platform of books, period, there's such intimacy there. You have to really engage with it for long periods of time, right? Like you have to, it's not like an article that you can skim real quick right. and kind of read the headline and maybe read the first two paragraphs and be like, I really got that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like a book, you have to really sit there with it and share space with it. And um, I think a book as open as mine is in terms of intimacy, it builds this it's real, it's an authentic sense of intimacy, but when you're sharing space with people and you don't know anything about them and they know so much about you, mm -hmm. you know, that they can remember your best friend from childhood and you're just like, okay, right. you know? Right. Um, and so hearing people come back to me and telling me about themselves, writing letters to me, mm -hmm. um, telling me the points of intersection of resonance in the book with them um, that struck them, that's always, that's been the most um, valuable, I think, interactions and exchanges after, post writing the book. Mm. And I'm sure there's a ton of that. Like, I, I mean, I know just sitting with you earlier, you, you were already hearing from lots of people since you've been here. So it's pretty incredible. Um, so let's talk about now the process of writing the book. Mm -hmm. So um, how did it start? Did, are you a journaler? Like, do you, like, how did, what's your process? It definitely started through journals. I think um, before it was redefining realness, it was just kind of my daily thoughts about, um, stories from my life and memories and so they weren't really even stories that they were just like fragments of memories that I knew that I wanted to like have a record of um, and so they were also informed by my daily interactions with self meaning um, this is before I stepped forward in Mary Claire which I did in 2011 and kind of told part of my story and so sitting there telling myself my own stories um, was a way for me to I guess strengthen myself a little bit and get ready for public consumption that comes from 
the public space of being visible. And so it very much started from daily journals. And I was, at the time, I was reading something called The Artist's Way. So I was, I don't know if anyone knows Julia Cameron's book, but I was doing morning pages, like faithfully. And I was single at the time, so I had lots of time to myself. So a girl was navel gazing for days. <laughs> um, and so it was very much from that process. And then it grew to not only wanting to write my story, but then talking to people in my life. My boyfriend who came into my life at the time, um, my best friend, opening up to her. Then the next level was Marie Claire, and then it was also politicizing my um, experiences through, well, contextualizing them through a political and social landscape and really making it more than just me. So this memoir is very much birthed out of my process over the last four or five years, and then it finally came forward. Okay, now that makes total sense, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think that for me reading the book, the people that I encountered uh, were such a huge part of the story, like you said earlier. And I remember you mentioning, I think in the introduction perhaps, that you talked to a lot of them before you were, before the book came out. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what is that like to have a conversation with someone? I mean, you deal with a lot of challenging uh, relationships in the book. So how does that, was it particularly hard for someone um, for you to talk about them in the book, or like, just help us understand that process of like publicly um, telling your story that involves someone else. Yeah, I think for me, like my parents were fair game because mm. <laughs> I because I could I did not get to choose them, so I felt like that I, it was completely fair for me to write very openly about their lives and their interactions with me. My siblings felt a little more shaky for me, and so I think I felt the most um, obligation probably to my brother Chad because he spent so much of our, we're only a year and 13 days apart. So we're born, you know, very closely. Our birthdays are always celebrated very closely. Um, and so I felt the most obligation and sensitivity towards him. And so that was like a tricky thing for me to navigate. So I, that's why I think that I spent a lot of time, if I was gonna write about someone a lot, I made sure that I had their voice in the book a lot. So I interviewed my mother, I interviewed my father, I interviewed my brother Chad, um, and interviewed my best friend Wendy. And so those were the four people that I felt were very pivotal um, characters in the book. But it's weird saying characters because they're actual right. people. Totally. <laughs> but it, it, for the reader, it's a character. Right. Because they don't really know this person. They know this person through my lens and experience and interactions with them. And so, um, yeah, that's, that was uh, the, the process of writing about people was people you love and care about, right, is also a difficult thing. But I think the one thing I learned with memoir is that it's not so much a space for venting or revenge. It's a space to really look at everyone um, in your life, even yourself, with the same brutal honesty and sharp criticism that you would look at quote unquote villains. And so in this book, there's, there's no antagonist to me. I think that everyone's a full person in this book. And I think that when you um, communicate that kind of nuance and complexity, it gives a more true experience. Like my parents, my parents were, like if you read, the, if you read Redefining Realness, my parents were super messy and ill-equipped and battled with drug addiction and abusive relationships and, you know, both had um, tons of children that they didn't really have the resources to take care of. And so, but I had to really look at how they grew up, right, in the same sense that I have to give sensitivity to how I grew up. And so when I could look at my parents as more than just these people who were my mother and father, but as their own people who had their own struggles and failed expectations and heartbreaks, I could paint a more full portrait. And so I hoped to do that with each character or person in the book in which I wrote about. You know, I definitely felt like I got to know them very well. And uh, that was one of the favorite parts for me of the book. Um, so after it came out, had your relationships, like, have you sat down and talked about like, the content about particular people? And how has that shaped? Has it strengthened or uh, hurt any of your relationships? Wow. Um, I think that's the, <laughs> that's the bizarre part, is that my, my parents were learning about me as the world was learning about me. Mm -hmm because I had never been so open with them about, like they're learning about their child um, talking about sexuality, talking about like creating a space for the erotic, talking about what she was doing with her body and you know the pain that they caused upon her, meaning me, I still even, as a memoirist, I still have a hard time with I statements, so it's, it's, it's really bizarre. So I think for my parents it was this weird um, sense of like, I'm really fascinated by this story, but this story is like about my child. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a weird space to be in as a reader, mm -hmm. you know, someone that's so invested. Uh, the first person that read the book 
in process was my boyfriend Aaron. Mm -hmm. And um, he was just like, wow, you really told it all, you know? And I think that he also felt there was like this weird sense of like Prince Charming esque like abilities that I threw onto him and he was like this isn't like necessarily true but I can see you know like for him it's not it's, yeah. it's not how he sees himself right and so like I think there's this weird for him it, that's what that's what he took away from the book but he was just like oh wow it was really interesting to see my, someone I love so much their full story through their own perspective and I think it was the same kind of thread with my parents like I finally had like a real in-depth conversation with my father three nights ago about the book um, and I think it was very difficult for him to get through the book because so much of the first half of it is about his struggles. And I was writing about it from my perspective as a seven, six, seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old. Um, and also his like gender policing of me right. as a child. Let's talk about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. So the one of the elements of the book that uh, I thought was particularly intense or um, had to be hard for you was when um, he discovered your, I guess, alter ego, Keisha. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who haven't read the book, I mean, maybe you want to explain? Yeah. OK, who Keisha was, and then I'll explain what happened uh, after that. So Keisha was, um, I invented her, I think, when I was 10 years old. Um, so my father had many different girlfriends, and they all had children. And so this one apartment that we settled in, there was a teenage girl. She was about 15, and I was about, I think, 9 or 10. And she would always talk to boys on the phone. And so she would use me to tell them you know, that she's not home, to lie to them. And so one day when she actually wasn't home, and there's this boy that she was trying to avoid, I was like, oh, you know, Michaela's not here, but this is Keisha, and you know, Michaela told me to talk to you, and so like I was just kind of telling these tall tales and fantasies and stories of like my would-be life as a girl because I, you know, I was um, perceived to be a boy throughout my childhood, and so at the time, being this very feminine child um, who who didn't yet know that she was trans, I expressed my girlhood through this character of Keisha, which felt closer to me than myself, even though I knew that it was very much a role. Um, and so Keisha began on the phone, and then Keisha went into real life um, during my spring break of like 1994 or three it was, I just remember What a Man was on. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to memorize salt and Pepper's What a Man, um, which I did, by the way. And um, I will not sing any of it here. But um, What if we do it together? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. And so um, that's a side note tangent. But um, yeah, so I brought Keisha out to the real world. And I was kind of, you know, my my little cousin, Michelle, who was like two years younger than me, we went out and I developed a crush on a boy who really liked me. And, you know, I had long curly hair at the time. Um, and so I was like, oh, I'm Keisha. And we had this little, like, little flirtation, very innocent. Um, and then one day when my father was picking me up on the last day of spring break, um, the boy, Jamie, knocks on the door and says, is Keisha here? Mm -hmm. And then it creates this whole thing that you have to see play out. Totally. Um, well, my heart was racing with yours <laughs> uh, when I read that part. And uh, yeah, so then I guess what happens next essentially is that your dad shaves your head, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think hair, uh, I mean, to me, seems like it represented mm -hmm. a way that you could express yourself um, in a, at a time when you weren't quite sure how or mm -hmm. what was OK or comfortable. And it was very natural to you. And uh, so that, I mean, how did it feel? And I imagine that it, it really felt like it stripped you of um, that identity. And then I know the process of growing it back and the Gumby, or you had like a, someone called you Gumby or something. <laughs> um, just tell me about that. So like how, what was your experience after that with your dad? So I think it was the first time my father really truly saw me. I think he saw me before, but he like it was easy for him to deny it because other people didn't recognize or see, right? So having this boy walk up into his sister's space and to say, I'm looking for Keisha, this girl. Um, my father, he needed to correct that. And so for him, he, you know, as you just explained, he shaved my head and that was my only sense of um, a physical embodiment of my girlhood at the time, right? Of my true identity as how I knew myself. And so my father doing that, he thought that he was erasing it, but hair does grow back, um, even though it was very traumatic at the time and I had to really go through it for a year and a half. Um, and it, 
I think that it was just this moment where he was very confused and he was battling himself and battling his own ideas of what gender is and what his role as a father was to raise this child that he saw as his son that was his namesake and all of these kind of things. And so um, I think that it, it kind of is symbolic of a lot of our interactions growing up. And you know, you see those, those little moments and he even th threatens me like years before that he'll cut my hair and it was always the big threat. And so when he actually followed through on that, that um, I think it was a major like pivot for in our relationship and I think it's great that a year and a half later I basically move with my mother to Hawaii and it's a completely different environment mm -hmm. right okay well yeah so. but it also shows like also the agency of young people like the lack of agency often in most homes where you don't have control over um, having the resources and funds to buy your own clothes to say that you want to do what you want and express yourself in dress in hair in makeup or adornments in any way and so a lot of times your parents are very much at least in, in the households that I grew up in it was very much um, we have a hundred dollar hundred and fifty dollars allotted to you at the beginning of the school year and we're not giving you a hundred fifty dollars we're going with you to shop mm -hmm. and so for me it was always like this pained time right like it was like oh shit I have to wear all these damn JC Penny polos and like <laughs> all this stuff that you know and cargo shorts and it's like oh lord like I have to wear the stuff you know because right, right, right. I have no agency to say that no and even no voice really to say that I don't feel comfortable in these clothes and this is not what I want to wear and this is more and I didn't feel that safety in both of my homes to do that from you know until I was maybe like 13 or 14 years old right it's, well I guess mm -hmm. that's no almost near the point where you met Wendy, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, it, and I think you guys together found ways to grab that agency and start buying the clothes that you wanted to buy, right? And so tell us a little bit about that inflection point in your life. Yeah, that was, you know, this, that relationship, I think it's one of those things where you, people, some people just come into your life at certain times, you don't know why. Right. And so Wendy was just someone who really saw me. Um, and she I, saw you first like, at school, right? Yeah, she saw me at school. I was picking up my brother from school. We're waiting for my mom to pick us up from the um, little playground that's between our two schools. I was in middle school. I was in the seventh grade. And my brother Jeffrey is six years younger, so he was in the first grade. And he was just playing, and I was sitting on the swings. And when he was walking by with her green bob and her high, you know, her super short shorts, soccer shorts rolled up, and her knee-high socks, and she just passed by with her volleyball, and she was like, Mary, are you Mahu? And I was just like, I didn't say anything because I wasn't ready for that sense of like reflection mm -hmm. and like recognition. Like she really saw me. And Mahu is, uh, I was in Hon Honolulu at the time. So Mahu is this, um, <clears throat> it's kind of a term that's, it's like a third space for gender beyond the gender binary, beyond male and female. There's a space to explore the spectrum, but it mostly was um, applied loosely if you bring the Western, Western colonized sense of what Mahu is. It's loosely termed as transgender, but that's not really what it is, but it's kind of a space outside of the male, female, and it's oftentimes for um, children that are assigned male at birth, right, based on the appearance of their genitals, and who are feminine presenting. And so when Wendy saw me, that's what she saw, even though I was wearing these polos so from JCPenney. Yeah, she basically clocked me. She spooked me. She was like, girl, I see you. Um, why are you trying to pretend? And I just ignored her. And so I was not ready for her yet. Right. And here she is so visible. And yes. So green and yes. So, like, and looking for friends and right. looking for like, girl, I see you. I'm going to come follow up later on. Right. And she did. And, yeah. And so when she followed up, what, what made you ready to talk to her? I think it, it, it's so deep. I think growing up in a home where I always had this dream image of my mother, right? So like if we, you have to really break down the family chronology. My parents met a year later, they got married and had me. Um, and they already had children from previous relationships. And they were fairly young, they're 23 years old. Um, and my mother already had two girls beforehand. My father had three children from high school messy. Um, and so then I come along the embodiment of what they believe is going to be their life together, their first marriages, you know, they're going to fulfill the American dream. And he was a Navy officer and she was, you know, this woman who worked in Honolulu and he's this black man from Dallas, Texas. And they meet, that does not work out because my father's philandering ways, my mother's just too high expectations from someone that she's not fully seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and so they break up when I'm about three. Me and my brother go and live with my parents. Um, 
and live with my mother in Honolulu. We stay with her for a couple years, then she sends us, because we need male influences, her sons need male influences, right, right. so she sends us to live with my father, who I live with for six years, five to six years. In that time, I don't see my mother at all. Right. Um, and my parents are both had the same parenting style, which is out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I dreamt of my mother. I had these huge dreams of who I thought she was. They were, you know, Disney prone and very, you know, way too much imaginings of this dream girl in my life. And so when I went back to Hawaii, I thought I was going to be the perfect son for her and like butch up. And Wendy's like, girl, no. That's not true. I'm looking at you and I don't see that anymore. And so I was like, I'm gonna hold on to it for a little while more for my mother, right? Because I think as children, that's what we internalize. We, if we do the right things, if we are perfect, then our parents will truly see us and love us and accept us and give us everything that we want. Well, and actually, I remember and so, saying, sorry to interrupt you, but I remember mm -hmm. seeing that it worked, like you did so well at school and that kind mm -hmm. of pride, I think was in line with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. so, like, that's part of being the perfect child, is mm -hmm. studying and getting good grades. Oh yeah, for sure. And and so I think that I really, I began, and within that year I began really seeing my mother for who she was. She's no longer this dream girl image of her. She was herself. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it did not live up to my, no one can live up to the expectations you have in your head of someone. And so for my mother, there's a sense that she failed me in my childlike mind, of in my adolescent mind. And so I decided to just be myself after a while. And I was like, this pretending to be someone else for her um, is not working for me anymore. And so that's when I accepted Wendy's invitations of friendship. And that's when we began going to the thrift store and, you know, pulling stunts in the thrift store and like changing price tags for like the color coded tag sales. You know, sometimes when you go, it's like the blue tags are 50% off. And so we were very much like scheming and, you know, going and it was a mess. But it was great. You know what I mean? It was like how we found agency with having very little resources. We could go in with 10 to $15 and leave with tons of little soccer shorts and you know high socks and shoulder pads for hip pads and all these kind of little things that we ended up doing and that we we carved out our own space for like womanhood together you know we developed that together yeah and so and she's still in your life right yeah she's still she's still my closest friend um and I think it's it's very interesting we've like had points of um our lives went in separate directions at certain certain points. I kind of write about it. And when we came back to in adulthood, really seeing each other again, it's so great to have that shared history with someone, but also just a sense that history also breeds so much intimacy because there's nothing that I've ever had to explain anything to Wendy. Mm -hmm. She just always has seen me and known me and affirmed me and validated me and also like nurtured me mm -hmm. as a friend. And like that's and I always think of like sisterhood and just good friendships and any kind of relationships, whether they're romantic or platonic or sisters or brothers or siblings. Um, that's the kind of relationship she's always had for me. And I think of what a blessing that was for me to be a 12 year old to find that friendship and then to develop it and still have it now um, as a 30 something year old person. <laughs> Totally. So in addition to the people in your life, uh, another theme that I saw come through was music mm -hmm. as, as something that you turn to. I mean, you already mentioned What a Man, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, we, I read about Aaliyah and I read about um, Tony Braxton and you know, the list goes on. I'm actually curious, who do you think in today's music world would be the equivalent for like, a trans girl to look up to or I think pop culture is so personal. Yeah, okay. So I think it's hard to say. Like I think some, you know, obviously trans girls, it's we're not all the same. So right. we would all like different kinds of music. You know, some may be into punk. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I think for me, I was very like pop R&B oriented. So that's why when Destiny's Child, mm -hmm. you know, came out with like No 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 and Bills 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 and you know Say My Name and Independent Woman, like that was like my life. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Um, and like I have like I basically have a whole chapter dedicated to like my love of Destiny's Child and Beyonce mm -hmm. because like it just shows how like media representations right seeing yourself in media and someone else that whose experiences are completely different than yours but who just has something that resonates with you and I think that for all of us that's very personal but I think that for me I wanted to not only be literary in my references right because I talk about spending a lot of time in libraries and reading books um, by a lot of women of color um, like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker but also like these media representations of like Beyonce and Oprah Winfrey and Diana Ross like um, 
And all of these women just kind of gave me this whole composite mm -hmm. of self that really showed me. So I think that's very personal, but it's also very like shared too. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think we talked a little bit about um, some of the points of pop culture, you know, yes. resonance for us. Totally, exactly. So uh, have you encountered any of these women like since your books come out? Like have you, has there been any kind of like crossover or have you met any of them? No, not yet. not yet. Not yet, Beyonce. I have yeah, not so met Beyonce. Beyonce this, is, <laughs> this is your chance to make an invitation. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So I think we're we're getting a little bit close. I have a few more things that we could talk about, and then we'll open it up for yeah. questions. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your Girls Like Us campaign. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about where that started and where it's at today. So it started. Um, it started specifically on Twitter at first. And so it was um, a hashtag of solidarity and space to share resources, stories, experiences, and conversations between trans women. And I started in March 2012. And since then, it's gone on to, of course, Google Plus and, and Facebook and everywhere where you can kind of do hashtags. And so um, Tumblr, you'll see a space for it, and Instagram, and all of these different spaces. So it's kind of like this social media campaign to um, claim space in virtual space, right, which nowadays is kind of real life space for trans women in a world where trans women often it's not safe for them to leave their homes. I mean, I think that that's something that people don't often realize that um, these social media platforms can be a lifeline for a lot of people who are struggling with identity, who are struggling with self, who don't have um, validation and affirmation and real life friendships. Because my experience is very bizarre that I grew up with a trans girlfriend, like my best friend was trans. Right, that I didn't grow up in isolation, but most trans women grow up in isolation. They're often the only ones, and so to have a space for young and poor and all these different kinds of trans women to come together and say, you know what, in this space, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+, we can have a space that's our own, that we can go to for a source of like mirroring and reflections and sharing and sisterhood. That's what Girls Like Us has always been um, for me and my idea of what I want it to be. I don't know where I'm taking it yet because I feel like there's just so much going on but I, I would like it to still I think that it, for me it would be creating a real life space for it and I think that it is still like a girls like us as a name and a and um, a brand is something that I want to have maybe for like a summer camp for young trans girls um, that would be like my legacy project that I would love to do with it great okay and then I guess one more question so it seems like uh, lately even in the last couple of weeks trans visibility is popping up in the media perhaps mm -hmm. more than I have seen it previously. Um, you were featured in the New York Times article last week uh, alongside a lot of other trans folks. Uh, we've got Laverne Cox and Orange is the New Black. Um, do you feel like there's some kind of turning point brewing or what do you think is, what do you think is next? What has to happen next? I think what has to happen next, I think it's like um, in actions of true inclusivity meaning that trans people are not these um, objects to be gawked at and kind of say, look at these trans superstars, right? That's a separate thing from us. I think that we really need to have more and more spaces. I think one that I would like to applaud that I was lucky, lucky enough to be a part of and humbled to be a part of was the Women's History Month Google Doodle, yes. right? Which included two trans women mm -hmm. of color in it, right? An Asian American trans woman and myself. And that's, that's the kind of actions that really need to be happening, I think, in media platforms to really think about the points of intersection in which um, trans women, for me, trans women are kind of how I center a lot of my politic, um, how we can include trans women in their different intersections in a lot of these spaces. Because trans issues are not its own separate issues. It's a human issue, right? We all have a sexual orientation. We all have a gender identity. And if we really break it down in that way, we, we see people as more complex. Um, more across a spectrum of just speaking across difference. And so for me, I would love for a big media moment to really happen where a media platform takes um, leadership in really sparking a conversation, say like a Time magazine, creating a cover to say that this is the next civil rights movement. This is something that we really need to begin really talking about. Because a lot of people do it as trend pieces. Like trans people are having a moment now. And for me, my entire life, trans people have been having moments. Right. Right. You know, it's just that you decided to, you decided to pay attention now. Yeah. But like we've been having moments forever. Like Christine Jorgensen was like around in the 50s. And like, you know, um, Carolyn Cossie was around in 
the 80s and 90s on this Arsenio Hall show. So none of this stuff is new. Like it's kind of cyclical, cyclical, and I think it's just media that says that, oh, this is hot now. Right. And so I think our culture is ready to develop language and to really discuss um, discourse with trans people about their actual lives and not so much about what they do to their bodies because that's been tried and true and done. So I think that a lot of the reason why there's been a lot of discourse lately is because trans women have been at a point to say that the way that you're reporting on my life is not cute anymore. Mm -hmm. And so this is why there's an issue with this and why it's reductive and why it's not enough. And that, yes, and you need to see us as people. Um, I am a woman and that's who I am. I happen to be trans and I happen to be black, but all of these things are a part of my experience. And if you really want to engage with me, please read my book first and then bring me on your show. <laughs> Hashtag <Right>. Shady Queen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I, th you know, this has been really great. I could keep talking to you for hours, um, <laughs> but I won't. Uh, so, uh, does anyone here in the room have uh, have any questions? Oh yeah, please use the microphone so that people on the live stream can hear. Hi. I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to thank you for being willing to be in the spotlight. Oh, thank you it's so been much. Very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was just thinking about how you were talking about being seen for who you really are. Do you feel like, uh, you know, it's been difficult for people to see who you are? Have you become very good at seeing other people for who they really are? Or is that difficult for you too? I think I can only truly see people if they allow me to um, share space with their experiences and stories. Right, so for me, I, what I've learned in this entire process of being very visible is not to make assumptions about people's identities or lives or pains or points of access um, or exile and oppression. And so for me, like I think there's only so much you can tell about a person by just looking at them. Um, and so for me, I think that as a trans person, as a person of color, as a woman of color, I don't make assumptions about people anymore just based on my vain interaction with them or how I may perceive them. And so that's the one thing that I think that um, I wish that we all would do. So that's why I appreciate when there's points of conversation in group settings when we say that, you know, what are your pronouns? Or you announce those things so that we don't assume what someone's gender is. Because you never know just based on looking on people, but I think that we've been, we've grown up in a culture where we just kind of, um, we just assume people's identities and genders and that's not necessarily something we should do anymore. And I hope that that's what bring these conversations kind of spark and bring up. Um, in terms of myself, I find that oftentimes I'm invited to spaces and only expected to speak about being trans, whereas I think that my experience is so much more than just transness. Not that speaking about transness alone is something that I shy away from or anything like that, but I'm also a woman of color. I'm also someone that grew up poor. I'm also someone that, as a teenager, engaged in sex work because I didn't have resources to have you know, health care and all of these different things that I think that I can speak to, but I'm not really called, brought to the table to speak about that. They're like, hey, young woman, we just want you to talk about being trans right now, as if that's my only experience. And most times when I navigate the world, most people don't know I'm trans. They often take me for a cisgendered, mixed black woman, and what does that mean to be that kind of a woman, someone that's objectified in the streets and all these kind of different points of intersection. And so I hope that we can have deeper conversations about people's identities and their true, and what their lives and lived experiences are, are actually like. Actually, could you define cisgender for those mm -hmm. people who aren't familiar? Sure, well cisgendered is a, um, so there's trans, Right, I think most people understand what trans is, and and cis is kind of the opposite in terms of a prefix. So trans means um, to cross, and cis it's kind of like chemistry terms, which is interesting. But this is really getting inside baseball a little bit. Um, I don't even know what that means. I just all often say that inside baseball because I don't even watch sports. But um, <laughs> but cis means on the same side of, and so they're kind of so when you're talking about cisgendered or cis sexual or transgender or transsexual, trans often means to cross and cis means to stay on the same side of. So often we're talking about relationships with um, your assigned sex at birth, which we are all based on the way that our genitals may look when we're born as babies. You're assigned a sex, which is often different from your gender expression. And so that's kind of, for cis people, they oftentimes most likely identify with the sex and gender that they were assigned with at birth, so they stay on the same side of, whereas trans people um, cross that or, or perceive to cross some kind of invisible barrier that we have in our culture about gender and sex and sex that's assigned at birth. So I hope that I explained that yeah, well. That, yeah, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions from the room? 
Okay. Hey. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you for being here. This has been really great to watch. Thank you um, for coming. There's this idea in the gay world um, of guys or girls who can pass, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, guys might be masculine or might not look like the stereotypical image of what a homosexual looks like, you know, to society. And whatever so, that means. Whatever that means. Yeah. Um, but what it means in day-to-day in -day life is that they have, they have to keep coming out mm -hmm. in the workplace with new colleagues, with new friends. They have to keep mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm gay, by the way, and this is who I am, um, because you can't tell. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you need to keep coming out in your life? Um, and maybe now it's a little different because you're in the spotlight, but in general, do you feel like you have to keep coming out about who you are? Is that tiring for you? And do you ever just want to just be a young woman and live and not have to keep explaining who you are in life? Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that I, I write something. That's a really great question. I think that what we're talking about is also is um, gender expectations. And I think that's the link between um, trans and lesbian, gay, bisexual people is this idea of gender expectations. So if you're if you're assigned male at birth and you're attracted to men, that's not following the gender prescriptions that we prescribe in our in our culture, right? And so oftentimes that means that to be a gay man that is feminine presenting, right? Then people go, oh yeah, that he's gay. Whereas you can be a completely straight man and also be feminine presenting, right? But we're talking about gender expectations, right? So like when you said that a man who doesn't who isn't um, seen as homosexual and has to continue to come out because he presents in a more traditionally masculine way, even though he's attracted to men, which often is prescribed as something that women do, not necessarily men, which is very simplistic, right? Um, and so for me, I do have um, trouble with that. And I come out um, and I disclose my identity as a trans woman for political reasons. Often in my personal life, I don't. It's not something that I do every single day. Um, I don't feel like it's people's right to know my story that my story is mine to tell in spaces of intimacy and relationship. And if I feel like telling someone, then I do. But I never feel an obligation to. Often in public spaces, I do if the, if the context is to talk about or to place me sometimes as trans. So it's like, so why are you in this LGBT space with this man because you look like a straight woman? It's like, well, I am a straight woman, but I am a trans woman. Mm -hmm. And so it's like really unpacking that for, for people oftentimes. But I don't feel an obligation. Politically, I do. And so I think that coming out or inviting people into your life is a politicized movement that we all do in our personal lives. And I choose to do that in certain strategic spaces. But oftentimes, I don't feel the obligation to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, it doesn't look like there are other questions, so I want to thank you, Janet, again for coming. I want to let everyone know that Redefining Realness is available everywhere books are sold, and I encourage you to read it. I read it twice. It's excellent. Uh, yeah, so thanks again, Janet, for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you all.